All right, let's discuss equations and equation writing. So when we get a look at what we're trying to achieve here with with writing equations, I need you to understand a couple things. The first is you do not need to memorize all these reaction types. You do need to have an exposure to them and a general idea just for ease in lab of day-to-day -day work, but it is not necessary for you to uh, memorize every little feature of what's going on in each one of these reactions. I'll mention the things that are exceptions or strange, um, but by and large we're going to be working through reactants and products in terms of things we already kind of know. So the first big type is decomposition reactions. Decomposition reactions we already know are reactions where a compound breaks into parts. <clears throat> parts of these I'll go slow on, parts I'll go fast on, they are all in your notes. Uh, a compound may break down to produce two elements. Um, tearing, uh, this says liquid because the sodium chloride in this uh, sample has been molten. It is over 800 Celsius uh, and is being, using a, a device called a down cell, being broken down into sodium and metal form and chlorine gas. And this should not be a solid, but um, the, that, the, that separation requires tons of energy. Um, some compounds can break down naturally, like, uh, for example, hydrogen peroxide breaks down into water and oxygen. Uh, you can use a catalyst to speed it up, but it happens uh, spontaneously. Um, a couple of examples of decomposition, <clears throat> magnesium carbonate and then magnesium uh, sulfite. Uh, metallic carbonates break down to make metallic oxides and carbon dioxide. Metallic sulfites break down to yield metallic oxides and sulfur dioxide. Very similar reactions, but you get the idea. Um, metallic chlorates break down to yield metallic chlorides and oxygen. So uh, a chlorate or a perchlorate breaking down, you're freeing up all that oxygen. And when we do the Hungry Dragon demo with um, a gummy bear and some uh, molten uh, sodium perchlorate or potassium perchlorate, uh, we get a very dramatic reaction in which that uh, energy exchange plus oxygen gets consumed very rapidly. Um, a couple special notes. Sulfurous acid de decomposes into water and sulfur dioxide. Carbonic acid decomposes into water and carbon dioxide. Um, hydrates decompose into salt and water. Uh, this is a, something, a process that generally requires heat because when hydrates form, uh, when hydrates form, they, this is sort of a natural feature of nature. The water in the air incorporates itself into the ionic crystal, and it, this is how it gets shipped to us from suppliers. And if we need to turn it back into anhydrous, uh, in this case sodium carbonate, we need a little bit of heat to drive off that water. Um, but that's a form of a decomposition. Addition reaction we also call synthesis, combination, composition, where two or more uh, elements or compounds combine. What we're going to see is the reverse of the prior set. And so this will be kind of quick. We can combine elements to make a new compound. We can combine compounds to make a larger compound. In this case, uh, oxides with water to make hydroxides. And the, this is a metallic oxide and a non-metallic oxide. Both can do that. Double replacement reactions, also called precipitation, precipitation or neutralization reactions. Double replacement reactions, we don't usually see, uh, or we don't see a change in oxidation numbers. Uh, we do, in double replacement reaction, have to consider what force is taking place to change this aqueous system of ions to where something new is formed. So, or something insoluble in some cases. Uh, precipitate formation is an insoluble substance being formed by a reaction of two aqueous uh, substances. So we have a whole lot of ions in solution and two of those ions will bond so strongly that water molecules cannot ionize them or pull them apart. And so you see crystal formation in water to where the attraction among the particles, the solute particles, that overcomes water's ability to pull, pull them apart. We call those things uh, insoluble and they are precipitates. So we need to have a good idea of our solubility rules to make this easy on ourselves. Um, this is the solubility rules. The first two are the ones that are really mission critical. Have to know those. Nitrates, alkali metals, and ammonium in salts are almost always soluble. The rest contain exceptions, but this rest of the set actually gives us a tool we can use to separate solutions of mixed ions. We'll talk about that in a bit. 
then we can look at different kind of double replacement reaction or sorry this is the exact type we just spoke about where we have an aqueous solution of silver nitrate lithium bromide put in the same container making a solid product this is our precipitate the silver bromide we would expect it to pool at the bottom of the container as it fell out of solution several different reactions can result in the production of carbonic acid sulfurous acid and ammonium hydroxide as products the thing is those products don't actually form um, carbonic acid when it's formed usually decomposes immediately into water and carbon dioxide sulfurous acid into um, water and sulfur dioxide and ammonium hydroxide you will start forming ammonia gas from your system if ammonia if ammonium hydroxide is formed or if ammonium hydroxide come together we're going to see ammonium release ammonia release in all cases the production of these new molecules um, is the actual reaction we don't get this salt formation or these these uh, uh, substances we get these gases forming and since these new gases form and can't be uh, re turned back into our reactants uh, this is a double replacement reaction with some special features um, this is a an acid system being exposed to uh, uh, sorry hydrochloric acid being exposed to potassium sulfite producing what we would think would be sulfurous acid H2SO3 well what ends up happening is that decomposes immediately to form water sulfide oxide and our other product uh, potassium chloride so there's no precipitate here but you do form a li new liquid molecules of water and new molecules of sulfur dioxide sodium hydroxide and ammonium chloride makes ammonium hydroxide you would think as a product uh, but that salt doesn't form you see decomposition into this ammonia gas and liquid water um, formation of one of those molecular substances we just spoke about this the formation of water or sulfur dioxide when that happens those ions are being consumed to make a new product and they can't reform so that's the reason those reactions work even though a precipitate wasn't formed um, we can look at a strong acid strong base system and then we see water formed that water formation is our new molecule that makes us a permanent double replacement reaction single replacement reactions are all about activity in the relevant elements involved and so we see a single atom um, or poly or, sorry atom or diatomic molecule being exposed to an ionic system in an aqueous solution and either it reacts or doesn't what dictates that the activity of in in nonmetals if the nonmetals being bubbled through the solution or the activity of metals if the metals being dropped into the solution so in the first example chlorine gas is exposed to potassium iodide and because chlorine is more active than iodine it's smaller we see uh, that chlorine replace the iodine freeing that iodide up as iodine and building a solution of potassium chloride ions the second example we have iodine trying to replace uh, chlorine in uh, potassium chloride and we don't get a reaction because iodine is less active than chlorine and here's that activity series for nonmetals most active fluorine least active iodine active metals are act this is the metal reactivity active metals replace less active metals or hydrogen from their compounds in aqueous solution okay um, you, we use the activity series and later on the year production potential tables to determine the activity of a metal the more easily oxidized the metal uh, replaces the less e easily oxidized metal and this is our activity series a little different from what we're used to but we have three sets we have um, lithium down to magnesium is in group one and group two or sorry lithium down to aluminum group one group two group three the most active elements then we have zinc down to lead those are transition metals then we have hydro, uh, hydrogen uh, between our transition metals and our precious metals uh, and then of course at the bottom the least active are the jewelry metals magnesium turnings being added to a solution of iron 3 chloride is a single replacement where we have to consider is magnesium more active than the iron in the molecule or in the uh, ionic compound in this case we look back at our activity series and we find magnesium is greater activity than iron and so we would expect replacement to happen and when doing we free up metallic iron and make a solution of magnesium chloride another type of single replacement water reacting with with sodium metal uh, when that takes place the sodium hydroxide forms aggressively really in what we're seeing is initially sodium oxide forms and then that being exposed to water makes sodium hydroxide with excess hydrogen gas
Combustion reactions we know pretty well involve uh, elements and compounds combining with oxygen to produce uh, oxides of each element. So if we're talking about simple hydrocarbon, like for example uh, C2H6 or something along those lines, we would expect this carbon to go make carbon dioxide and the hydrogen to go make water. Okay. Hydrocarbons, carbohydrates, and other organic combustibles combine with oxygen to form CO2 and water. Ethane being burned looks like that. Ethanol being burned looks like that. The next feature is writing net ionic equations. Uh, I'll go over this rather rapidly because we've already had exposure to it. But when we write a net ionic equation, the key first is we write our molecular equation or our classic equation as we're used to. Then we will write the complete ionic equation, which means any... Uh, substance that ionizes in your solution should be written in ion form. If it doesn't dissolve or ionize, then you don't. Finally, a net ionic equation will have the spectator ions from the complete ionic equation removed, and all the active ions will be expressed. And this is an example of how we go from the classic um, chemical reaction, the molecular equation, and then we ionize all the ionizable parts there, sodium chloride, then silver nitrate, then on the product side, uh, sodium nitrate, and then we have this solid precipitate silver chloride. And then finally, what we should see is that certain things cancel, and since they cancel, we lose them from our net equation, and that's chloride plus silver, making silver chloride. There's another example. It is in your notes. The next thing I want to discuss is selective precipitation. We can remove the ions from a solution one by one using just the solubility rules and some tools in school. Um, qualitative analysis is a process of separating and identifying ions in a solution. It kind of hinges upon selective precipitation. So what I want to do with this question is to separate a solution that contains silver, barium, and iron ions, in this case iron-3 ions. Um, and what we would do is look at our solubility tables and say, well, how can we move one of these? And if you just look at what is not soluble listed here, you should see a path. Um, the first example will move chloride ions, and probably in the form of silver chloride, to... Um, sorry, not silver chloride. We'll move uh, samples of sodium chloride in to add chloride ions on uh, to the silver to make silver chloride. So this can come in any form. Sodium chloride, lithium chloride, any soluble chloride. Um, next, we've removed our silver chloride. It's precipitated. We would then filter it out. We have our solution now containing only barium and iron. In this case, we could now take advantage of the fact that barium sulfate is not soluble. Add some sulfate. For example, sodium sulfate to our solution. That would precipitate barium sulfate, which we could then again filter out. Finally, we can add hydroxide or sulfide to bind the iron, then filter that out, and we will have separated the three uh, sets of ions from our solution. And by now, you've probably been looking at that list at the base, and what's highlighted in yellow has become very important, hasn't it? You probably noticed that, wow, and I can get silver out, lead out, or mercury out with adding chloride. I can get <clears throat> sulfates out um, with, uh, I'm sorry, I can get, um, in this order, uh, silver out, and then barium out with sulfite sulfate, pardon me, and then iron precipitates with hydroxides or sulfides, which usually there's a pretty clear path. Again, this is a topic, kind of an old chemistry topic, but nobody wants to let go of it because it's neat. And so here's another example. Um, oh, pardon me, not another example. Yeah, here it is. Separate lead, barium, and nickel. This time we have lead, barium, and nickel. And, you know, you kind of see again, I can get lead out with chloride. I can get out barium with sulfate. And that will leave behind nickel. Nickel ions will precipitate because hydroxides are insoluble or slightly soluble. Um, you could also have used uh, sulfides or something of those natures. But these bottom two are insolubles. So that leaves us into quantitative analysis. This is a, a 
basically in uh, a chemistry experiment we can determine exactly how much of a component is present um, using these skills and massing out what we've got in our system after selectively precipitating out parts. Uh, grav grav gravimetric analysis is a little sim more similar as a quantitative procedure where a precipitate containing a substance is formed. We filter it off, dry it away. Imagine we did this procedure, these last two sets we did, and we filtered and dried and weighed uh, each of them to see what exactly we had in the system. Uh, and see how closely we could quantify the masses of each present in that solution we began with. Um, very challenging chemistry, but also lots of fun. Um, this question says, the zinc in a 1.2 gram sample of foot powder was precipitated as zinc ammonium phosphate. This is a complex ion where you have more than one cation. Zinc and ammonium acting as cations and phosphate acting as the anion. Strong heating of the precipitate yielded this mass of zinc diphosphate. Calculate the mass percent of zinc in the sample of foot powder. So beginning with the mass we were given of, of the uh, zinc um, diphosphate, we're trying to just find the mass of zinc in the foot powder. So the zinc of in this mass of foot powder was precipitated, and we got it all out. It all came out in the form of this. Okay. Then we heated that precipitate, and we got this mass of zinc diphosphate. Okay. Now, what we need to acknowledge at that point is that we don't have any other way for zinc to have been present in the system. Therefore, all the zinc here must have been in our system initially. We can then take that mass, use the molar mass to get to moles of zinc diphosphate, and then do a simple mole conversion to see that, hey, in one mole of zinc diphosphate, I've got two moles of zinc. And for each mole of zinc, I have this mass. This is the exact mass of zinc that we found to be in our system. The total sample had this mass, and so our ma mass percent of zinc, part over whole, times 100, 14.62. And then we have a different question. We have a mixture contains sodium chloride and iron 3 nitrate. Uh, that sample of the mixture is dissolved in water, and an excess of sodium hydroxide is added, producing a precipitate of iron 3 hydroxide. We filter the precipitate, we dry it, and we have a mass of 0.128 grams. And so we have this mass of this sample of stuff. We need to find out the mass of iron that's in the system. Similar to what we just did, we take that mass of iron 3 hydroxide, convert it to moles. Then we recognize that for one mole of iron 3 hydroxide, we have one mole of iron, then convert to mass. This is how much iron was in our system to begin with. Then we need to find the mass of iron 3 nitrate. That's on slide two. To do that, we take that mass of iron we just found, and we go per mole, convert into iron 3 nitrate, and figure out what the mass of iron 3 nitrate would have been. And there's that mass. Then the mass percent of iron 3 nitrate in the sample. So if we have 0 0.290 grams of iron 3 nitrate in the sample, and the total mass is 0.456, mass percent of iron 3 nitrate is this value here. This divided by this times 100. We're going to go ahead and stop right there and we'll continue in the next video with acid and base reactions.